Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Anjum Ahmed. Uh, he was with us last week. I will introduce him again for those of you who were not here last week. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is uh, the ACFA Healthcare Global Chief Medical Officer, and he leads enterprise imaging and artificial intelligence innovation initiatives uh, at ACFA Healthcare to help healthcare organizations across the globe enable value-based care models. Dr. Anjum, uh, before ACFA, worked at GE Healthcare for 12 years, implementing healthcare IT solutions across Europe, Middle East, South Africa, and Canada. He speaks at uh, thought leadership events across the globe regarding the intersection of technology, machine learning, and cognitive computing, applications in healthcare, and impact on population health. Dr. Anjum was uh, recently interviewed by Financial Times of London at the COGX event in AI in London, England and uh, in recognition of his global experience in the field of value-based application of AI and medical imaging. And we're uh, very pleased to have Dr. Anjum Ahmed back again uh, for part two of his uh, AI and radiology lecture series. Dr. Ahmed. Thank you so much, Dr. Omar, and uh, absolute pleasure to be back again. And it was also a fascinating listening to Dr. Kolak because it, it kind of gave me a sense of deja vu because when you start thinking about application of this technology and, and what I recall uh, based on what we were doing in regards to implementation of AI into uh, radiology and imaging, uh, th that kind of starts resonating and that is the whole purpose of this conversation today, uh, if you can already see my screen. Okay, perfect. Uh, so what I wanted to capture uh, today was the practical application of AI uh, whether it is uh, being developed for your research and academic purposes, or if there is already, uh, and let's say an FDA or regulatory cleared algorithm that you may want to bring into your practice. And uh, similar approach uh, that I've seen resonate with some of the early adopters of this technology is that if you position this in the framework and the context of value-based care, uh, you know, quality of care, how are you going to be observing some of the key performance indicators, that it became, the, the adoption of technology then becomes a bit uh, easier and uh, application. I uh, just, just to clearly, uh, you know, to indicate I, I come from ACFA Healthcare, uh, I'm their uh, chief medical officer and also responsible for some of the innovation work that we are doing with uh, AI and machine learning, digital pathology. Uh, I, I try to cover general industry trends, not talking about products. And uh, some of the AI and machine learning uh, examples that I'm going to give you are either works in progress, uh, FDA cleared, uh, CE marked in Europe, but not yet Health Canada cleared. So what I would like to cover today, uh, you know, just a recap in the next two slides of what we discussed in the previous uh, session uh, in general AI trends and uh, where do we go from here when it comes to application? What is enterprise imaging? Why not PACS? Why enterprise imaging? And what did we learn from the, the transformation that we've seen with the, the lessons learned from electronic health records, the EMR solutions and systems out there? And, and as I mentioned, the, the practical application of AI and interesting that we were previously talking about value-based care, value-based medicine, how to make sense out of this. As, we, as I elaborated in the last conversation that the way we see healthcare under transformation and with the focus around precision health and, and moving towards personalized care, the, the role of radiology has become more and more significant because not only the radiology has been at the forefront of uh, adoption of uh, you know, digitization or these innovative uh, technologies, even when we look at uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning, uh, radiology still has been at the forefront where some of this development has been going on in regards to the use of these applications. And that's where the discussion in the industry has been focusing around, you know, how can we be more predictive with new detection of new diseases and all these pandemics that are popping up? How can we improve care coordination across the continuum of care? Do we, do we have care variances? Do, what do we learn from those care variances? Uh, and, and, and system uh, optimization. The, the idea was, right, that uh, as we discussed, the, the application of AI, right, as we said, there was a previous question as well, right? Is it branding? Is it marketing? Is it deep learning? Is it machine learning? So the concepts that we have seen evolve mostly in, in medical imaging centered around how do we use some of these applications, whether 
you are training certain data sets based on machine automation, or are you performing certain image analysis and, and correlating those uh, image analytics with patients' physiological data? Because pixel uh, data itself uh, may not be, in certain cases, good enough, because then the question is, what is your ground truth? Did you base uh, your algorithm development only based on pixel findings, or did you correlate it with a particular ground truth uh, as well when you were working through your uh, specifics uh, with these algorithms? And I'll share with you one example that we, we went through when we were developing a particular algorithm and training the data sets and the models. So while, while we talk about these possible applications, if you recall from the, the previous uh, session, I, I, I spoke about the infrastructure of AI, right? There, there's so much going on. There are several uh, vendors who are developing some of these applications. And uh, one of the challenges what we have seen was with uh, you know, the quality of data is the data that the data that was used to develop some of those algorithms, was it good enough? Is it, reflect, is it, a, reflection, is it a reflection of what your uh, population geography and demographics are? Is it representative of your population? And that's how, you know, uh, what we heard in the previous uh, conversation as well, that how industry, academia, and businesses need to come together. So what are those particular avenues that we feel uh, that the industry and the academia needs to come together? Because you may have a project that is more of an academic significance. You may be conducting certain research on certain clinical conditions in, in the population sample. Uh, you know, COVID always comes to mind right now because there is so much variation in regards to clinical manifestation and representation, how patients with COVID uh, present. So what are the particular findings? Do we need correlation with patients' previous clinical history or pre-existing conditions and what we see on image or, or, or how do we analyze and validate this? So that's where we've seen some of the initiative that we, we were exposed to and, and a varying degree of, uh, depending upon whether you were talking to a particular academic institute a public health authority or a government, how would they want it to validate the clinical use case of the application of this technology? Another emerging uh, concept that we are seeing here is also the, the use of AI and machine learning at modality level. This in itself uh, has pros and cons, and I'll talk about this in, in, in the later uh, sections of, of this presentation. So, as I uh, summarized uh, last week, that the, the focus of this presentation today will be around the, the, the enterprise imaging approach. Why have we moved from PACS to enterprise imaging and why uh, application of AI then begins to make sense because it, it, it is the model, the platform approach. It is about bringing the multi-specialty data, automation of workflows. And also, as you saw in, in the initial slide, that there are hundreds of startups out there how do you bring all that together in a clinically relevant context in terms of clinical research, academic, peer review, peer learning? How, how do you go about deploying this? It is, the PACS is a thing of the past. The, the industry is moving towards enterprise imaging and enterprise imaging offers that uh, paradigm shift. So what are the big data challenges as you would have been uh, exposed to in regards to how our digital universe has been expanding the, the amount of data that we are generating in healthcare with not only the clinical data, but you know, new research and clinical trials and scientific studies that are being generated. It's becoming challenging uh, for physicians and researchers and, and caregivers because they also need access to your outcomes that you have learned as a result of this academic research. And in most of the cases we have seen, it is not embedded into radiology practice. So how do you bring that together? Something uh, that we uh, could go back to is the evolution of medical records. What did we learn from digitization of electronic health records? You know, we used to write and, and you know, prescriptions and, and you know, reports and, and even for me as being a GP in the past, sometimes it was difficult to read my own handwriting and then talk, or asking a machine learning algorithm to go about reading this. The, the evolution that took place from paper records was towards a digital uh, transition strategy where some of these departmental uh, avenues or workflows were, were digitized and, and converted from paper to digital. This evolved further from these silos of digital, uh, uh, silos of these different workflows to a more cohesive platform so that instead of being paper or disparate IT systems, 
the, the medical records have had developed a particular platform approach. So it was seamless coordination. You had full control of the data. So the, the EMR systems or the electronic health records became the source of truth for physicians for access to uh, clinically relevant data. But then the question was, what about medical imaging? 70% uh, or, or even a more uh, clinical context uh, in regards to patient resides in medical images. And medical images were still in their particular silo. You had PACs for radiology, PACs for cardiology. You had even PACs for advanced applications where you would do uh, oncology or nuclear medicine or breast imaging, different workstations, different uh, you know, modalities sending different types of uh, route, rerouting of images from one, one workstations to the other. Uh, you know, th there's so much going on in regards to medical imaging. And as they say, a picture is worth a thousand word. Uh, I'd say a medical image is worth a million pixels of clinical intelligence that is just going, just, just lying there and nobody is, is bringing that intelligence into clinical uh, context. So the concept of enterprise imaging precisely addresses that particular challenge. That instead of having multiple databases or solutions around PACs or risk systems for reporting, mobile or web applications. VNA had been gaining traction as well in regards to the, the imaging repositories. And as, as we all know, in Canada, we are much ahead of, uh, as compared to what we are seeing in the US, for instance, and in, 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 in consolidation of medical imaging records with the diagnostic imaging repositories that we have in Canada. Imagine the, the, the level of the kind of data that it provides in regards to how we use AI and ML. So if you, if you correlate this particular AI box with the previous slide that I showed, with hundreds of startups, think about how you can then bring these AI and, and machine learning applications into a framework that, that allows you to leverage the enterprise imaging platform with its consolidated module for the, you know, the archive and helps you enable that clinical uh, paradigm shift in regards to how you are more collaborative because you have you're now building similar to electronic medical records, one ecosystem for your medical imaging uh, records, similar to what electronic health records did. And that's where we believe at this level where we can start thinking about a machine, the application of machine learning, because as they say, right, uh, garbage in, garbage out. If your data management strategy is not optimized, how do you believe that, you know, the way you will practically implement AI would be reflective of the quality of data that you are, are you exposing the algorithm to, not only for research and academic, but also for clinical application. And that's where at the top we, we, we said precision health, precision medicine. It's, it's not about developing new applications or, or uh, you know, software solutions for each and every individual patient. Uh, the goal uh, being, if you can find uh, cohorts of population sample with similar clinical conditions, what have you learned from their outcomes? So where does this framework around AI come into augmented intelligence or the enterprise imaging strategy? The idea is to, to have this on a standards based approach, which is vendor neutral, because integration is, is a particular challenge that uh, the industry is talking about. And also the shift around, right, that this is not about replacing the physician. It is man and machines working together so that you can reap the benefits and uh, benefits of this technology. Because as we say, machines are, what are the machines good at? Speed and efficiency. And if we can automate some of these uh, manual tasks that radiologists or clinicians are, are performing today, these are some of the use cases that come to mind in regards to seamless workflow integration. But the question that uh, when, when someone asks us that what specific area that we need to focus on? We need to think about how these, this technology is going to influence certain care pathways. What is our baseline? What, what challenges did we have today? And how are we using the, the, this technology to improve certain care pathways by applying these machine learning towards the path of a, a comprehensive uh, patient record? The challenge, what we, we saw was uh, five years ago when we were exposed to some of these new developments on AI, the 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 basics of you know the 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 standards out there right whether it is DICOM whether it is IHE standards DICOM SR uh, you know uh, we discovered that some of the startups and developers did not understand even how radiology departments operate 
uh, what is the, the workflow between a modality to packs and what kind of data, uh, metadata that they were generating. If they were generating proprietary tags, for instance, the interoperability perspective then becomes a problem because if you are using proprietary tag and these cannot be displayed into the, the viewing platform of a radiologist, uh, how do you even uh, you know, gauge the, the performance or, or the accuracy of these procedures? So what use cases should one consider if we were to look at this uh, standards-based approach that we were talking about? And I mentioned previously that we look at, uh, for instance, the colleges of radiology and what uh, some of these thought leading uh, organizations are talking about in regards to the use of AI and, and defined use cases around abdominal breast imaging. This, coming, this came from uh, the, the American College of Radiology. They have around, I think, 21 use cases uh, revolving around some of these specific uh, area. Uh, recently, they have added uh, COVID as well, uh, uh, the use case around COVID and the use of imaging. It's one discussion that whether imaging is sensitive or specific enough when it comes to COVID, whether chest CTs or X-rays, but again, the idea is what kind of data can be generated to perhaps uh, uh, predict uh, a predisposition uh, to some of these findings of an imminent chest X-ray uh, around you know, use cases and workflows. The Canadian uh, Association of Radiology talks about workflow optimization and how we could improve CAD uh, because that was one of the challenges with computer-aided detection or computer-aided diagnosis, as it may have been called previously, how radiomics could be brought in and improve the quantification of tumor uh, with uh, you know, decision support systems uh, within you know, the framework I spoke about around precision health, bringing the, the genomic data. And there are some initiatives going on in, in, in certain countries around uh, data aggregation when it comes to UK, for instance, where Royal College of Radiology has also defined certain uh, clinical pathways around the use of this kind of data. There was uh, some more work recently done at uh, the Royal College of uh, UK, uh, Royal College of Radiologists, and uh, they, there was uh, also discussion around uh, AI being implemented on modality versus PACS, and I'll talk about the pros and cons of this approach. Uh, there is some back and forth discussion going on, and that is something that uh, we believe have, so will have some uh, uh, influence on how AI is being implemented at uh, various country level and, and at also uh, some of the governments which are getting heavily involved in regards to uh, thinking about the, the funding of some of these AI applications. So the integration challenge I spoke about and, 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 and to take this forward, as I, I mentioned in the previous slide, are you looking at siloed AI versus ecosystem of AI applications? Because as we said, there could be a single application developed by one particular startup that looks at, for example, a nodule detected in a chest CT. Whereas there may be another uh, AI algorithm that looks at perhaps volume measurements, volume doubling time. And then the question is, how do you create that functional package? And that's where the integration challenge comes because you may have noticed uh, with some of these applications, uh, they kind of produce varying degree of outputs, uh, results, metadata, and also how you view that and consume that data. And that's where uh, we feel that uh, the, the interoperability perspective comes in, that if you're able to funct create functional packages of multiple AI applications in a seamless user experience, so that the radiology department or the clinical user do not have to worry about which particular application do I launch for which particular use case. So the kind of automation going on uh, from that perspective. The idea is that if, if uh, a particular, ex, a particular AI algorithm was tied to a specific modality, then you're limiting the use of this particular AI uh, use case to that particular modality. Because uh, as we see here in Canada, right, because we, we are talking about provincial imaging repositories, while the hospital has a radiology department and you have your own modality environment, but if you were to load a particular AI algorithm on a particular modality that is only validated for a few mod modality types, what benefit does it bring to your entire care continuum or use case? And that's where we, we believe that the discussion around having AI embedded at an enterprise level, at your enterprise repository or diagnostic imaging repository, where it allows you to automate and facilitate the results that are derived from that metadata from AI 
so that AI is like seamlessly embedded into your working environment. And that's what radiologists have been asking us. I am used to working in my ecosystem, uh, my radiology dashboard, uh, empower me there, uh, push as much as relevant information for me so that it is more specialty focused and it is powered by the automation technology that sits behind uh, the, the, the enterprise imaging platforms. That's where you benefit from metadata and I'll talk about it in, in the next couple of slides. What, what kind of metadata would we read from these AI uh, black boxes or machine learning uh, algorithms or servers to turn this into actionable intelligence? Because that's where you can look at certain uh, outcomes or, or KPIs that you want to derive out of this uh, to, to, to understand uh, is the algorithm performing to the level of accuracy that you expect from the algorithm on your population sample? If it is, uh, what outcomes is it improving? Is it making you more productive? Is it helping you find uh, certain incidentals, for example? Uh, are you detecting earlier, faster? Uh, are you able to improve your report turnaround times? Are you perhaps uh, ingesting more patient population with the same funding that was provided you by the government as part of your operating budget, because that opens up a discussion around right the the, the the proof points around the benefit of this technology. That if you were to spend uh, 100,000, let's say US dollars or, or Canadian dollars on a particular workflow, what does it translate into cost savings, ease of detection, early detection, time savings for the radiologist, improve productivity in reporting and better turnaround times. So these are the things that uh, we are engaged with some of the early adopters to, to generate some of these use cases and studies. Because uh, as we said, uh, as also we heard from Dr. Collock in the previous slide, while there have been a lot of retrospective studies, what the industry is missing today is the prospective analysis on, on the performance and behave, behavior of these algorithms and what benefits they have brought in regards to improved outcomes. The other, uh, the aspect of this is, right, that uh, you have an algorithm A, as I mentioned, one single AI application, but what you would want to do is package algorithm A with B with C, and that is what you would expect from your enterprise imaging solution provider or the PAX provider, that are they able to, to tailor some of these benefits and use cases to you in a seamless way so that you have a, a good visual health intelligence picture or digital twin of your patient that is, uh, that is based on um, multi-specialty clinically relevant data, but also the analytical intelligence that is coming as a result of uh, uh, some of these algorithms. So where do, how do we embed this? Where do we go? What have we learned from the, the, the previous uh, you know, experience that we had with early adopters, some of the challenges that we faced and how we are going about moving forward. We, we, we heard uh, you know, from the, the colleges as well, the Royal College, of radiologists and other uh, esteemed bodies regarding the aspect around clinical triage. But you have to keep in mind, right? If an AI algorithm claims that they are able to triage uh, for you, you have to keep in mind that what these AI algorithms generate is metadata with certain abnormality scores, for example. If your PAX vendor or your enterprise imaging solution provider is not able to analyze that metadata or the abnormality score, then your PACs will not be able to triage anything for you because this data from this AI machine learning algorithm will sit somewhere and your work list uh, or radiologist work list or, or uh, uh, clinicians work list, they will still have those list of cases that you still need to go through because it will only show you the results when you open that particular study. There will be no triage. So that's where uh, what we are trying to do is educate uh, the users and the industry in regards to who is triaging actually. Point of care analysis is also significant because here we talk about, you know, the, the, the real-time analytical data. Uh, you mentioned a previous use case, Dr. Kalak, regarding intracranial hemorrhages. Now, if your PAX solution is not able to uh, trigger a particular alert or notification based on the abnormality score that was detected by this intracranial hemorrhage, then how good is your point of care analysis? Because it may be 5 p.m., you, you're done with your job, patient may have done, uh, finished with the CT scan, uh, the, the algorithm picks up an abnormality, what happens next, who reports it? How do you escalate this kind of finding through your PAC system or, or through your 
uh, application layer. Uh, and then what I'll talk about is the application around population health, right? The cancer diagnostics, chronic disease management, some of these use cases where uh, we have seen a significant application of uh, and, and interest coming in and from the uh, rest of the world. But one thing I mentioned previously was uh, tuberculosis. This was a project that was uh, uh, given to us by a particular government in Middle East where they had a screening challenge with uh, their uh, residents in that particular uh, country. Uh, they had our PAC system and they asked us, how can you, you have so much data, could you use this enterprise imaging workflow engine of yours and automate and triage for us uh, some of those uh, x-rays that have suspicion of tuberculosis? So we developed, uh, and, and, and it was interesting that I initially, when I thought this was an Africa, Middle East, Another challenge, uh, when we published that case study, uh, we were approached in Canada as well, that there was some interest in leveraging this type of technology in our rural communities and the Northern Territories, because uh, Canada was also involved at some level or the other with uh, the, the World Health Organization in supporting some of these initiatives around fighting uh, tuberculosis. So what did we do? We looked at, uh, you know, more recently with the, the Canadian Association of Radiologists, and there was also a recommendation from a Canadian Association of Radiologists to, to, to see the use of some of these advanced digital technologies and fighting and eradicating tuberculosis, because WHO has an initiative going on in regards to the, the uh, early detection, and they have a list of uh, countries that they have identified that they are going to fund for some of these initiatives around the use of this technology. What did we do and what did we learn? So we developed an algorithm that uh, looked at chest x-rays. Uh, it was obviously, as, as Dr. Pollack mentioned, we went through the same cycle of uh, data collection, ensuring that the data that we collected for development of the algorithm versus the data that was used for testing and validation was unique. Uh, there, were, uh, there was initially certain challenges around defining, uh, as I mentioned, right, what is the ground truth? Are we going to develop and train an algorithm based on radiology suspicion that if a radiologist looks at uh, a chest x-ray and they are suspicious of certain consolidation or findings, uh, should we train the algorithm based on that level of analysis or should we correlate these, uh, the x-rays that have done tuberculosis test or tuberculin or sputum test and they come out positive? So that is where uh, we were shifting back and forth as part of the development. We created a workflow for uh, the radiologist over there in that particular public health institute where they were able to actually add a comment that if they uh, agree with uh, the way algorithm is triaging some of these findings or if they disagreed. And if they disagreed, they provided the reason, for example, if it was uh, pneumothorax, pneumonia, enlarged heart, you know, some of these other findings. So the algorithm kept learning and, and, and developing. When we finished the, 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 when we completed this particular phase of data collection, we had exposed it to 6,000 x-rays in the beginning. And then we installed a, a test application at one of their uh, exam centers where they performed, would you believe 2,000 chest x-rays every day for screening of tuberculosis. So the algorithm was exposed heavily to the, the workload and, and the kind of data that was fed in. The, the end result, while the, uh, the, we achieved a, an AUC of around uh, 0.90, I think if I recall correctly, it was uh, two years ago now. The, when we took this particular algorithm to another hospital in site within the same city, which, had, uh, which was a follow-up center for confirmed uh, cases, uh, for kind of a diagnostic center, the performance of algorithm was a bit different. And that's, where I, that's why I, I mentioned at the beginning, the ground truth correlation of what you're developing with these applications has significance because it, it dictates uh, the, the intended use of this application. And when you submit it for regulatory bodies, you want to make sure uh, that the population sample on which the data was developed, uh, on which the data uh, development model was made of, the, you know, the, the ethnicity, because we, we deliberately went to a particular geography where, where we had a population sample where uh, tuberculosis uh, you know, was, was more prevalent in the people of those countries, uh, but they were actually in Middle East, not from you know, those Asian or, or African countries. 
So that was a good learning experience. And as a result of this exercise, obviously the, the, the idea was to see how chest x-rays could be used in regards to triage. Uh, because if uh, the, the, the comment that came to us from the other uh, countries or Western world was, TB is not our challenge. We have other issues, like we want to make sure if uh, you know, we have an exam backlog, uh, specialists and radiologists are spending more time in your reading subspecialty. So we want to find a way where we can at least say uh, this particular X-ray looks normal or with uh, insignificant findings so that we could triage some of these X-rays uh, between normal and abnormal. In one of the talks that I was in earlier uh, this year at uh, the, the British Institute of Radiology, uh, and Royal College of Radiologists in, in the UK, there was the discussion around help us uh, isolate normals from abnormals and then let the, let the radiologists decide which cases are critical ones to be followed up with further investigation or you know, the, the, the automation of uh, reporting and results. So that's where uh, I think one of the use cases, and, and obviously now the, the, the number of requests that we have received uh, during this pandemic to look at COVID related uh, chest X-ray findings that has, you know, kind of shifted the whole uh, paradigm in regards to where uh, chest X-rays may be helpful in at least uh, triaging some of these suspicious findings uh, when it comes to uh, assessment and, and development of these pandemics. There's one particular application that uh, has received Health Canada clearance uh, for uh, the use case. They had actually, I was pretty impressed with uh, the, the published data that they had on their website in regards to how they developed, how many number of physicians versus how many number of radiologists that they had in, in terms of testing and analysis. And we are uh, exploring ways into how to incorporate this into clinical use uh, because this product is actually, uh, as I said, Health Canada regulatory cleared and ready. The other use case that frequently in, in, the, in, the, in the discussion around when I mentioned cancer care is lung cancer screening. And this was uh, something that uh, we've heard uh, not only in the US, Canada, the UK, uh, also certain other countries in, in uh, Western Europe. The, the challenge around uh, the, the, the challenge around early detection. And in the UK at NHS at the Cancer Vanguard, they have a specific initiative that looks at the, those top five cancer conditions uh, that they need to see where technology can be implemented to help improve uh, detection instead of like stage four versus stage two, uh, helping improve the patient survival rates as well. So what did we learn and uh, what did we do in the framework of what I spoke about, the clinical packaging of AI. So we looked at, we looked at a couple of algorithms in regards to how the disease detection and, and uh, not disease specifically, some of the detection around quantification and, and identification of some of those uh, nodules, for example, and then the, the ability to automate uh, volume measurements, for example, uh, vessel suppression around the area where uh, some of these findings are, that is something that we embedded, uh, which we are going to release pretty soon, into, into your radiology reading workflow so that some of these manual tasks that you have to perform, like you know, trying to see if there was a current, if this is a current scan, where is the previous scan for this patient? is kind of doing automated hanging protocols, for instance, based on the metadata that is available from the AI algorithm so that you're not only doing uh, correlation with the current and the previous scan, you're doing automated measurements, volume doubling time, and also maybe doing lesion tracking and lesion management as part of the whole framework around embedding some of these applications. So what I just gave you the example here is kind of embedding maybe one algorithm A with algorithm B with an algorithm C that may have been developed by our company, another company, a third company, bringing together into the mix in, in terms of the framework of, uh, as I said, detection, because radiologists may also want to know when they're looking at this particular suspicious nodule or finding, I mean, depending on the size of the nodule or previous history, where does this patient fall on a cohort of population uh, in regards to if they were adenocell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and, and correlating it with path histopathology findings uh, if they exist for this patient. Because that's, that's what allows you to bring now a more informed or intelligent decision-making uh, aspect uh, that 
you know, today when, when, when I was demonstrating last year this at uh, RSNA in, in Chicago, the question that I asked to radiologists was, if you look at this finding or a particular suspicious nodule, it may be close to a vessel. How do you know it is a vessel or, or it is a, a solitary nodule or, 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 you know, what do you do next? Uh, the, what do you know about the history of this patient, for instance? Do you know if this patient has other findings? The three answers that I get was, if we have a, a requisition or a request that details uh, something about this patient, or this, the reason for particular exam, we would imagine what is this going on with the patient? Or in the second answer was, we would go into our electronic uh, medical records for this patient and try to dig in more data with, uh, regarding this patient. And the third answer was, uh, we don't know what we don't know about this patient. But if there is an, an ability, because as we said, right, how do we know this algorithm is accurately identifying a particular suspicious finding? The, the, the information needs to be correlated with either your uh, knowledge about this patient, uh, where does this patient correlate with similar findings, or if there is another lab results or histopathology. So that's where we feel that machine automation, not only looking at pixel intelligence, but also bringing it together in context of uh, the, the clinical records associated with or maybe this patient, or at least showing you where does this patient fall in, in the, the previous rec historical records of other patients who may have sim similar findings, uh, which were biopsy confirmed adenocarcinomas, for example, or, or, or other uh, benign findings. So that gives you some uh, you know, level of visibility in regards to how you are then practically implementing the use of this kind of technology. The, the other use case uh, that uh, comes up is breast cancer screening. And uh, the, with the prevalence of the, 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 the cancer findings and conditions when it comes to breast imaging around the globe, there are use cases and certain challenges associated with screening. We, we, we talk about CAD and the challenges associated with CAD, the false positives, the, uh, the, 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 the recall rates, and those have been certain challenges that the industry is talking about in terms of how we bring uh, the, the value-based application of these algorithms so that we can correlate this with our current practice, whether it is a screening workflow or it is a symptomatic uh, patient follow-up or, or clinical workflows. Because today, if you look at it, there is no automated assignment of or caseload management. Certain hospitals are primary healthcare screening centers. So they may already only be doing certain level of assessment or BIRADS, one or two, for instance, uh, and then referring these patients to uh, another hospital or site. Uh, other hospitals are doing double reads. So there is inter-observer -obs variability aspect of this as well. And, and the recall of these patients and also the other aspect that we hear about is uh, the high cost of unnecessary biopsies that may have been done because if this woman, uh, a patient with dense breast and a CAD application failed, or, or if AI was, do we know if the AI was sensitive enough to even function on women with dense breast, uh, breast density data, if it is not available, uh, you may end up uh, requesting a particular follow-up procedure for this patient, maybe an invasive procedure. And if this invasive procedure turned out to be negative, then uh, uh, where does AI come in? And there is uh, one particular uh, study, a prospective study that uh, we will be conducting, but because what we did was, a uh, couple of customers uh, in, uh, in Europe and in Middle East, they came to us and said, we are interested in the application of this technology. This technology is FDA cleared, regulatory cleared. And then let's look at this because if this algorithm is able to identify for us particular masses and is able to give it an abnormality score, how, let's, let's devise a workflow where we could correlate these findings with our VIRADS workflow because it provides a decision support criteria and also looking at a comparative data. So we did a, a kind of a blind analysis and it's just recently, uh, last week, we completed the phase one of this evaluation. We, we challenged the algorithm developer that we will give you blind uh, data with no results and finding of difficult cases uh, from a particular uh, institute so that you come back to us with those findings so that the, the, the institute or the hospital, they will be able to compare these abnormality scores with those difficult cases that they had and how did it correlate with uh, whether uh, the, these were biopsy confirmed cases, whether these were 
uh, correlated with uh, patients that they had difficulty reading and if they performed, let's say, uh, an ultrasound or a particular follow-up exam. So interestingly, the, the results were interesting and we are uh, looking uh, towards publishing some of those results because we still need to go to the prospective phase. And this is something that we did on an algorithm that was trained on over 1 million mammograms. So it isn't that the algorithm wasn't trained enough. What we wanted to do was now take a value-based approach where we wanted to correlate the performance of the algorithm to the actual workflow and what outcomes are we going to see improved so that this particular hospital uh, is able to justify that particular business case and in, in investing in this technology. So that was an interesting experience that we had and it is uh, proceeding in a, a with very uh, you know optimistic and favorable results and in, in, in that whole paradigm around not regarding the accuracy or the, the, the performance of the algorithm, it's in, in more around the, the outcomes based analysis of uh, the application of this like type of technology because we believe that this is what the industry is mis missing today that okay so what if the algorithm is so good what was it able to achieve for you in your clinical practice and care delivery to your patient population and that's where we believe the next generation uh, you know enterprise imaging ecosystem would look like in regards to embedding these ai applications uh, you know making it more modality agnostic vendor agnostic so that you could automate and correlate some of these patients' specific findings to, to the level of data that you have uh, when it comes to automation of your hanging protocols, uh, making real-time collaboration, whether you're working outside the hospital, within the organization, uh, the challenge associated with inter-observer variability, uh, you know, double read, whether AI becoming your virtual assistant with the data that is aggregated. And, and that's where mobility uh, aspect comes in as well. And that's what we see and more and more requests coming to us as well that maybe a one particular, because if you think about, you know, the last comment in the previous session regarding funding, right? Who pays for this? So if you're taking it to a provincial level, then that means you will have multiple instances of different PACS systems out there. So that's where the data platform, the enterprise imaging platform comes in because if you have these applications embedded on a, on a universal viewing platform, so then it is irrespective of whether you are on PAX A or PAX B, you will have the, the technology embedded into some of your applications so that your work is still centered, centered around your patient and you're able to complete those mobility uh, aspects of these work. And mobility, as we know, has become, <laughs> become more enhanced now uh, given the times we are with uh, this pandemic. The, the whole conceptual model, uh, irrespective of whether it is the chest X-ray algorithm or, or any other algorithm that we could talk about, uh, is the idea around how uh, enterprise imaging at, at, at its core can pull in data from some of these AI applications and then intelligently automate the distribution of these results. Because as I said, AI can detect uh, whatever you will train it to uh, detect but then the, the, the power of automation and workflow around correlation and automation becomes pretty uh, significant. So how does it end up? Irrespective of whether you have multiple AI applications or as we said, embedding AI applications into radiology, cardiology uh, for either universal viewing, for your peer learning, whether it is for academic, diagnostic or research, because then you will have that data lake. That data lake will allow you to, to run data analytics based on some of the clinical challenges that you want to address or, or the, some of the population health challenges that uh, the, the, the city or the, the province or the health authority that uh, are looking at addressing uh, to improve reporting and some of these turnaround times. Now, how to summarize this? As I mentioned in the beginning, electronic medical records, they went through their evolution and, and transformation in regards to how they move from paper to digital and on from digital as well to one platform. Medical imaging was missing that perspective and enterprise imaging has brought that particular strategic approach to, to medical imaging so that you can think about this not only in terms of value-based care because value-based care is all about delivering quality care, cost-effective quality care where you can also recognize some of these outcomes, not only for your caregiver engagement, but also patient, because we are all talking about patient care. We 
uh, we want to make sure that uh, the, the, the application of this technology resonates in a way that uh, we recognize the, the KPIs, key performance indicators or, or outcomes that we want to measure in a meaningful way that result in improvement of certain metrics. And that's where uh, in, in the framework of precision health, we say we, we want to embed AI, but we also want to make sure that we do it in the right way so that these, some of these smart applications of the use of this technology makes sense, not only in terms of reporting, collaboration, or, or bringing uh, that immediate access to results and reports. And if we were to look at it in the context of cost, quality, and, and outcomes, uh, some of the, the areas that we, as if, if you correlate with what I mentioned in the previous slides around uh, bringing evidence, ground truth. What was the ground truth of the algorithm? Uh, because you cannot implement a particular AI application if the ground truth for those, that particular application was for a different use case. Although it may have been a chest X-ray algorithm for detection of tuberculosis or pneumonia or pneumothorax, but if it was based on a particular ground truth, then that may mean you may not blindly expose this algorithm to your entire workflow. And that's where uh, we believe that uh, it will help reduce certain errors in delivering the quality uh, that uh, needs to be monitored with these cases. Uh, one, uh, I was having an engagement with a couple of hospitals here in, 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 in Canada and in the UK. And I asked this question to some of uh, the, the health agencies and bodies that who pays for this? You know, what are we, what are we going to measure as part of the cost benefit analysis? Uh, several answers on that perspective, because as we said, what are we measuring? If a particular hospital has particular funding uh, for uh, their, as part of their operating budget, but if they are able to prove in, 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 in the use of this application, that by investing in this technology, they were able to reduce some of these uh, you know, redundant duplicate procedures that they were performing. So that has an indirect impact on the, the resource capacity uh, and also the, the, the automation that brings the value in regards to speed and efficiency of diagnosis, detection, uh, you know, more collaborative uh, approach, because that's where uh, we, this is where industry, academia, and the solution providers come together to define, uh, you know, okay, good technology, FDA cleared, Health Canada cleared, let's define those metrics. And this is what we, uh, we, we are not only discussing and proposing to, uh, to the industry thought leaders or early adopters of this technology, but this is what we also want the, uh, the, the users of this kind of technology in the future to ask those challenging questions uh, in terms of the, the use case and benefits. I want to thank you so much again. Uh, as you may imagine, this topic is so huge <laughs> and wide. It's not easy to, to, to bring together uh, everything in 40, 45 minutes, but I tried my best and I hope that this would trigger some dialogue and follow-up discussions. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much. Questions? So this is actually a question from earlier tonight. So, so dictaphones and speech software are used, right, to translate medical records. Is there a role for having an AI watching what you're doing and how you're interpreting data, maybe having eye trackers and things like that to actually train an AI? Interesting, interesting question. Uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, reporting or, or dictation systems, uh, there has been some, uh, there have been some NLP engines that look at, you know, what you are dictating and when it translates into text, for instance, if you made a mistake uh, regarding a body part, or, or if uh, this patient is not that particular gender who you were reporting against, uh, it, there is some work going on in regards to the use of natural language processing with the assessment of uh, reports that are being dictated. Uh, it is also being used in the context of uh, uh, you know, quality assurance, for example. So the, the, the AI or NLP engine going back and in, in, into, so let's say you have this provincial imaging repository, right? So if there is an algorithm that can go back to retrospective, like one years of retrospective data, and, and then is able to correlate with certain reports and results, and it may find this uh, creepencies there, right? Because if uh, this is as part of the quality assurance. So certain uh, health authorities or regions are also discussing this 
and there is actually a, a, a particular initiative that go, is going on uh, that we are collaborating with someone. I am not at the moment at uh, be able to disclose disclose this product, but it is actually what it does. Like retrospectively going into and running that NLP engine to to bring quality assurance perspective. Thank you. Great, thank you, Omar Errol. Do you have a question for our speaker? Uh, you can go first. Uh, yes, there's uh, one more open question, perhaps um, um, Dr. Ahmed or Dr. Kolak can, or you, Amber, can take a can take a jab at that. So it's from um, Dr. Sobolewski. Is there data in regards to the cost effectiveness of these programs? Will the hospitals and departments have to spend more money to apply the, for the same results. Should I go first? Sure, go ahead. Okay, uh, so different uh, geographies have different criteria. Now, what we are seeing in the UK, the, the NHS in the UK, the health, uh, National Health Services, they have allocated, uh, I think, $75 million UK pound or, or more perhaps, and they're releasing it in phases to hospitals who want to use this technology. So from that perspective, uh, the, the, the funding is not, an, uh, not a challenge. Neither they have to prove that uh, there are outcomes improved. What they will do is actually uh, apply this technology for let's say three years. And in those three years, the, the solution providers would actually prove that this technology that was implemented in, in the year one, year two, or year three, uh, what were the KPIs or, or outcomes that uh, they were monitoring that were improved. And if those will be scalable, to beyond those particular hospitals or institute that were awarded this AI project in the first year. And I think this is what we are missing here in Canada because that's what I mentioned. In 2017, Canada was the first country to talk about an, a national level AI strategy. What we did not do was translate this strategy at the level of healthcare in regards to what would be the application of this technology in healthcare uh, I, I see the way I see it uh, when I, I go to, to countries in Latin America or, 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 or here in Western Europe as well. They are a bit ahead of us because they have thought about it in regards to the funding models. They have uh, they've also defined certain areas, clinical areas, where they feel that there is a challenge and technology can be implemented. Uh, so they have looked at it from that perspective. And I think this is what uh, here in Canada we need should, to do as well. Because there will be no free technology. So obviously what, what is happening is these uh, industry and solution providers, they would have a contract with the hospital for let's say six months. So use the technology for six months and we will provide you with those KPIs and what benefits that you will see as a result of this technology. And then uh, that's where I think there is a particular area where we in Ontario at least uh, can work together with the hospitals and businesses. Errol, do you have any comments? Actually, it was a, I enjoyed your talk. There's a, a few points, I guess they're not really questions, but comments, but I agree with Dr. Ahmed that uh, an enterprise-wide solution is, is critical because you want to bring together these disparate systems and, uh, you know, the, the additive effect of each component will give you a much greater sum. It's, uh, you get such uh, insight from all these different components of the data and, um, you know, that, that's the first comment, so I, I fully agree with him. I think it's absolutely critical. And the other comment that he made towards the end of his talk, which I fully agree with, is... Uh, you break my car. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> this, well, we are past well, I'll fix it. I'm well, sorry. Talk, so that's okay. Is there Let me deal with that and I'll answer. I'll give you a question in a second. <laughs> Priority. So, of working from home, <laughs> I locked myself. <laughs> I love it because you actually get a little peek on people's lives. Yep. Demystifies them a little. I'm sorry, Omar, you were going to say something? No, I was just going to actually close. I think that was our sign that we are. We are <laughs> so, um, I think on behalf of, of uh, Dr. Simpson and uh, Chloe, um, thank you to our speakers, Dr. Anjum Ahmed again, and uh, Dr. Errol Kolak, who's now busy with his kids. 
uh, and to all the participants uh, for joining us uh, again this week. If we didn't get to any questions, um, uh, we have them and we will respond to them uh, by email. Uh, and just a reminder, both, both weeks of talks, all three talks will be available uh, on the Queen's Radiology Department of Radiology website, uh, probably as early as next week. Uh, Errol, you're back. Uh, thank you very much uh, again for the wonderful talk and uh, for giving us a glimpse into your home life. <laughs> yeah, sorry about the little meltdown. Uh, I cleaned up his toys and he didn't like that. <laughs> but he waited until seven o'clock. Someone <laughs> told him, seven o'clock, you can go talk to dad. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have good a day. good dinner. Bye, everyone.